the class, as I've reviewed all of the material that you guys have covered this semester so far, and, and it just really it was blown away. Um, I had a little trouble coming up with what I was going to talk about because you guys have covered so much already, but um, I think tonight will be helpful. Um, and um, I hope that you all can appreciate sort of what difference this will make, uh, meaning the whole class in, in your experience. Um, I wished I had anything like this when I was in school. Um, uh, I graduated in the, from business school in, um, that's 1991, not 1891. I know that, you know, might, might seem older than that, but, um, uh, you know, we, it was just a, the whole university was a different place at that time. So classes like this and, and just the entrepreneurship and pro program in general <coughs> and the, um, the whole entrepreneurial environment around Georgetown is, is, really in the last bunch of years you've you've all probably witnessed some of the the greatest growth that's occurred i mean it's been slow baking for probably about a decade uh, the last couple of years have really exploded um, i've been involved in the alumni side of the entrepreneur community uh, around georgetown and i'll mention something at the end that, that i'm working on now that you know may not directly apply to you this summer but will uh, hopefully you know, once you guys graduate and, and become entrepreneurs yourselves and, and start looking for investors, uh, we now have a piece of that, uh, you know, to plug into the, the ecosystem there. So um, I'm going to dive right in. And um, let's see, let's put this on. I lost all of your faces here if I put this on full screen, but it'll pop back. I think it'll pop back up. So yeah okay everyone can is there anyone who can't see the presentation i'm showing full screen see. here so i think we're good i think in the bottom of zoom you need to click the the share screen button oh okay make yeah. sure yeah. that, yeah. 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 that, is. that. Yeah. nope good missed that step sorry uh let's see let's go back to zoom yeah i, I teed this all up before we started and then skip the step there we go there we go all right, so everyone's got it? All right, terrific. <clears throat> All right, and just so everyone, I, I, you'll hear me coughing and clearing my throat a little bit. I have been tested, I am all clear. Um, not that any of you are in danger, but nothing to worry about. Um, all right, terrific. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, I know Mike uh, mentioned uh, the book that I wrote a couple of years ago. And <laughs> to give you a little background as to why I wrote the book. Um, so I graduated, as I said, in 1991. I started my career uh, at JP Morgan and um, went back to college, or went back to campus to recruit pretty often. And about two or three years after I graduated, I was in the career center, sitting inside the room, looking outside at the you know, college seniors who were I, the, the, the seniors that I was about to interview. And it just, it struck me in that moment that there were so, I, I was a degree in finance from Georgetown. I had a really what was my dream job on Wall Street, um, but there were still so many things that I had learned since I graduated. And I said to myself at that time, I wished that there was a book that told me all the things that I needed to learn or, or have learned since graduating. Um, sort of, you could call it the on-the-job training or what have you. And so planted a seed many, many years ago for me. Um, over the last nearly two decades, um, I've done all sorts of programs for Georgetown and, and through the Alumni Association um, involving career. So panels and interview prep and, and things like that. Um, and, and over the years, I developed a lot of material. And so one day I said about five years ago or a little bit more, I said to myself, hey, if I could just organize all of this material, I think there's a book here. Um, and that was, that was sort of the background. Now, needless to say, it was um, from, from what I thought <coughs> was gonna be a you know, two to three month project, it was more like an 18 month project. Um, but nonetheless, I, I published this book. And while even in my own admission, I think reading it today, I would say it's, it's a little dated. Um, as all print material becomes the minute the ink dries. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, but I will say, um, I am still 100% confident 
that the core messages are still there and the skills that I talk about as being foundational are, um, you know, are still true. Nothing has changed in that front. So, um, you know, I talk about networking and business writing, sales and presentation skills, um, or sales and negotiation skills, I'm sorry, um, organizational brand, uh, organizational awareness, personal brand, executive presence, and then of course what we're gonna focus on today, public speaking and presentation skills. Um, what I wanted, the books, the, the business books that I read in my career uh, that I liked the most were the ones that were actionable instead of ones that I read and kind of got some ideas. I liked the ones that I could actually put into practice, which is what I tried to do with the book that I wrote here. Um, and recognizing that for every, <coughs> every one of the chapters I wrote, there were potentially hundreds of, of individual books that dealt with every topic. So by no means is any one of these chapters exhaustive, but what I tried to then do was point to the resources that I thought were the best, things that I had come across in my career, uh, whether they be other books or websites or sources of training or what have you, um, that helped me the most. So it's really meant to be an overview and it's really meant to be a, um, a launching point. Tonight, as we talk about speech, uh, public speaking and presentation skills, I'm really thinking as broadly, I'll use those terms interchangeably, but I'm also thinking of those terms as being very broad. And, you know, a, a public a speech, so to speak, could be <clears throat> anything from, um, you know, your, your weekly staff meeting to a pitch to an investor or a client or it could be something more formal in front of large groups of people and, um, you know, and potentially press, you know, just to, to give you an example. So <clears throat> really everything that I'm talking about tonight applies in every one of those situations. The skills are very similar and very transferable. The key it, to where you guys are in your career, it's probably unlikely that you'll be in front of hundreds of people uh, as interns. But I would encourage you to use every speaking opportunity, even that small, you know, team meeting where you're giving people a weekly or a daily update. Use that as an opportunity to practice and learn and, uh, and practice some of the skills that we're going to talk about tonight. <coughs> so for this section, we're going to talk about three things. First of all, why is it important um, uh, instead of me just telling you to trust me and, and I'm going to try to demonstrate for you why it's important. Um, overcoming anxiety. People have all different levels of anxiety around public speaking. Um, and so I've, I've learned both through trial and error and, and training and practice ways to overcome that. Um, <clears throat> and then some just some tactical tips. Uh, again, we could, you know, public speaking is an entire class. What I want to do tonight is give you some ideas to get started and um, you know, and places to go for, for more, um, more help or more resources. So, <clears throat> excuse me, first thing I'll say about public speaking in terms of why it's important, you never know when you're going to have to give that big speech in front of that big room of people. And I'll just, I'll share, you, share with you one of my experiences. So my second job after Georgetown, I was at JP Morgan for about five years, then I went to work for Arthur Anderson, and <clears throat> the person I went to work for, uh, I was working for just basically one senior person at the firm, and uh, within about six months of me joining that firm, she was fired. And so I was sort of left hanging. I had no manager, no boss, no work group. And so I very quickly transitioned, and just coincidentally, back to or, or to the Georgetown alumnus who helped arrange the interview to get me into the firm to begin with. Um, but I wound up shifting my role to what he was doing and that was business development. And so three weeks, so six months after joining the firm, three weeks after that, I was probably 27 at the time roughly, um, we had to do a presentation in Frankfurt for 300 regulators in the financial markets in Germany. And so I went from having been sitting in those small staff meetings giving you know, weekly updates to that third 
image that I showed you, you know, actually this <coughs> is intimate compared to the room we were on. This was a full blown stage, microphones, there was, there was German press there, and there were about 300 people. Um, I had zero public, tra uh, public speaking training prior to this. Um, I would probably, looking back as to where I am today, I'd probably give myself a maybe a C plus or a B minus. We got through it, <coughs> extremely nerve wracking. But, um, but my point of sharing that story is really to say you really don't know when those opportunities come along. And it's, it's best for you and your career and your firm and your product to be ready to be ready for those. So, um, <clears throat> you know, don't, um, don't assume that whatever job or you're taking, whatever role you're in, whatever company you're working for, you won't find yourself in a situation like that. Um, you know, you, you may be, you, you will have graduated from Georgetown. You know, you, you may even be the smartest person in the room at the time, but if you can't clearly articulate your thoughts and your ideas, people won't know it. And, and many, the reaction I get from a lot of students in particular, when I say that what I'm about to say now, is that <clears throat> your underlying abilities will be judged by how well you can speak in public. And the reaction that I normally get is, well, that's not fair. And my response is, well, there's a lot of things in your career and in business that are just aren't fair. Um, but let me give you a, let me give you a, let me try to prove that a little bit by saying this. Obviously, speech, speaking is the, you know, most basic form of communication there is. There's a very human element to it. And so by way of example, if, if someone were to come up to you, someone you didn't know were to come up to you and start speaking in a very hostile tone of voice and, and using hostile language, you probably can all imagine how you'd feel as a result of that, even if they didn't actually pose a threat. But the way they speak makes you, evokes a feeling in you. So move that example into a business context where if you're trying to sell somebody something, whether it's a product, a service, sell them on your idea, you're looking for investors, you're trying to persuade somebody. I mean, in any, any aspect of, of business or professional life, if you're not <coughs> a confident speaker, they're going to translate that lack of confidence about the way you speak, but it's gonna translate, it's gonna spill over into whatever it is you're trying to do, your product, your idea, whatever, however you're trying to persuade somebody. So um, it, it really is that important. Where you guys are, I think we're gonna wind up using the skills most of the time is, as I said, in like a weekly staff meeting or a video chat like this, but, but there's no reason not to use this as an opportunity to be very thoughtful about how you go about preparing and delivering your speech, even if your speech, quote unquote, is you know, three minutes long. <coughs> Um, you know, generally, people, you know, at, at, within a couple of years of, of beginning work, almost in any company, you're going to be spending anywhere from a third to a half, 50% or even more of your time in meetings. So all of those, all of those settings are opportunities for public speaking. So just bear in mind you know, the, the work product that you produce obviously is important and goes a long way, but, but the way you're really going to, the, the wrapper on whatever it is that you deliver, the work that you deliver, is the way you demonstrate your value to a company is by, by being able to articulate your work and your ideas in a very clear and concise manner. <clears throat> So that's, that's kind of the why. why. Why is this important? Why should you care? Let's talk a little bit about um, the anxiety piece of it. Um, you know, you, you've heard, there's jokes out there about, you know, most people would prefer to, to um, you know, do anything, you know, death and taxes, right? Or, 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 you know, things that are despised more than public speaking. 
Um, I'm hoping my, my intention tonight is to convince you that no matter where you fall on the spectrum around, you know, on, on the level of anxiety in delivering a speech, whether it be a small speech or a big speech, if you could imagine yourself on that stage with 300 German financial regulators staring back at you, um, wherever you fall on the level of anxiety, there is a way to improve that situation. The good news is I will tell you for this particular skill, <clears throat> Being average <clears throat> or even slightly above average is a game changer in, in your career and in your business. Not many people, this, this is kind of a, a skewed curve. So there's a lot of people on the low end of the curve and the high end of the curve in terms of being able to speak well uh, in this type of a setting trails off very, very quickly. So my point is it's not very difficult with some effort, but it's not, it's not too difficult to actually be very good at it. The bar is not that high. Most people don't do very well here. So, so how? So how, how do you get good at public speaking? Like a lot of things, it's practice. Now practice, it sounds simple or maybe even too simplistic, but don't confuse simple with easy. The premise of the book and all the things I wrote in the book about these skills, this idea was that these were skills um, that you could acquire and practice throughout your entire career. And you really will. You'll, your opportunities to speak will, will grow as your, uh, as your role grows. And so some of the key um, some of the key ideas around practice. Uh, so just imagining a situation where it's either six or eight people around a conference room, it's a weekly update, or maybe something slightly larger. You're part of a small team of people who might be pitching your product to, uh, to a customer or a client. So just get your, get your mind in that kind of a setting, um, what I talk about the next couple of things. So, to, to practice a speech like that or a presentation like that, you're gonna to wanna to try to replicate the uh, environment as best you can. So, you know, sitting at your desk looking at slides or looking at your notes, your, your speaking notes, is gonna be very different than actually standing in the conference room, maybe the exact conference room if, if it's possible, and if not, some conference room that replicates it. Physically standing up, being exactly in the same position you're gonna be in, as you're doing this presentation. Um, the key, you know, and, and knowing your material, right? That's, that's the key. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that more in just a minute here. Um, but very simply, right? Practice with increased practice comes increased confidence. Your performance goes up and automatically your anxiety goes down. And this, this then feeds itself, right? As your anxiety goes down, your confidence goes up and your performance goes up again. So there is a, you know, there's a flywheel effect here that begins with confidence or begins with practice rather, and then feeds this confidence cycle. And that's where I would say most people don't do. Most people fail at the practice part of it. I, I don't know why it's always struck me. Um, and again, if you've read parts of the book, you'll see I, I really pound this idea of practicing. Um, if you think about actors and musicians and, and you know, athletes, and the concept of practice for them is second nature. But for some reason, business people, the concept of, of practicing something, it just sort of, sort of falls away. And there's a lot of kind of winging it. And there's a lot of you know doing it on the fly, and sometimes <coughs> there are time constraints <coughs> that make that um, that make that necessary, but not always. And I would argue, depending on what the you know you you, you might spend five or ten minutes practicing for your weekly uh, staff meeting, but you know how important is that new customer? How important is that investor? And so. As the stakes go up, I would argue that practice goes up. And then that would be practicing yourself. If there's multiple people involved, have multiple people practice with you. And, and 
The answer to the question I always get is, well, how much do you practice a speech? I would say it just depends on how long it takes. I mean, how long it takes for you to deliver that at the highest level of performance that you're willing to accept. So <clears throat> let me give you, again, I, I like to, I don't like to ever say, just trust me, um, you know, believe what I say, because I've been through it already. Let me try to offer you a little proof. So for anybody who says they are um, anxious about public speaking, or, they, or they, even if they get a little, even if they wouldn't describe it as anxious, but they get a little nervous in a public speaking situation. If I were to ask anybody like that, if they could stand in front of a room of 50 or 100 people and talk about their hometown where they grew up, no notes, but stand in front of the room <clears throat> and for 10 minutes off the cuff, speak about your hometown. And of course, anybody can do that. And the reason you can do that is because you are intimately, in, it, you're intimately aware uh, or comfortable with the content, right? You could, you could do it without any thought because you, you have such a grasp of the material that there is no anxiety because you're just talking about what you know. And here's where I'm gonna bring it back to practice. To give an outstanding performance in the form of a presentation or a speech, you just have to know your material dead cold. That's the bottom line. <laughs> and we'll talk about an example where PowerPoint really can become a PowerPoint or Google Slides or what have you, really becomes a crutch that undermines uh, your performance, that undermines your, your presentation skills. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so th th these are sort of the tips. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first tip I would say, uh, I would mention is um, Toastmasters. So I wished that prior to giving that speech in Frankfurt, I, I knew what Toastmasters was. At the time, um, <clears throat> I, had, um, I had heard of it, uh, but I didn't know really what, know what it was. Uh, I think the organization does a terrible disservice because the name is so deceiving, or at least it was to me. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with making toasts per se, but um, just for any of those uh, on the call who may not know. So Toastmasters is a worldwide organization. Uh, there are chapters throughout the world, hundreds and thousands of chapters. And the whole purpose of a Toastmasters group is a, it's a peer to peer learning experience to become a better public speaker. So every chapter is a little different. I would encourage, first of all, I would encourage all of you when all of this is over, um, you can actually find the clubs before this is over and be ready to be involved um, once life gets back to normal a little bit. But um, what I would say is go to several different chapters. And the reason I say that is they all have a different feel and a different makeup. So don't base your, don't base your opinion on the entire of the entire organization based on a single chapter. So I've I've moved cities, I've moved you know three or four times, and uh, have found chapters in each cities. But I'll usually go to three or four different chapters before uh, I'll actually join one, just to get a feel of the of people and the way it works and and you know it's it's um, level of activity. Um, but as a as a quick overview. Toastmasters <laughs> will take you through all aspects of public speaking, everything from the tone in your voice to your, um, your body language, working with uh, visual aids, whether it be PowerPoint or just a, a physical a vis visual aid, a product or something, um, how, to, how to sort of help that. There's a very, very well uh, regimented program. And once the, everyone comes in and does a, Kind of a base program is about 10 or 12 speeches that you give um, over different weeks and then and then there are dozens and dozens of specialties beyond that a um, couple of other reasons i mean beyond beyond just the experience itself the, the learning opportunity um, toastmasters is extremely well uh, recognized credential so it's after having completed 
uh, a, a set of speeches, you earn a credential for that. That is, that is recognized really. Um, most companies, most employers will, will recognize that. Um, the other thing is uh, Toastmasters is a terrific place for networking. So whether you graduate with a job, without a job, you're an intern, what have you, it's a really, really great way to, to meet some people and, um, and do some networking. So um, I would <coughs> encourage at a minimum, anyone who's not aware of Toastmasters, spend a little time. This is a link, by the way, here in the presentation, so it'll just take you to the main site. Um, check out what it's about. We get a little break either in between school and internship or you know, over the course of the summer. Um, at least visit one chapter. They'll be everywhere throughout, throughout wherever you're interning. Um, get a feel for what it is. And I'm sure there's one on Georgetown's campus as well, uh, once you're back in the fall time, so. All right, so we're also gonna talk about, <coughs> excuse me, planning the speech, um, and then some sort of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts for uh, PowerPoint, or, or any other visual aids for that point. Um, all right, so I talk about, I think about, <coughs> excuse me, I, I think about three uh, aspects of preparing a speech or a presentation. Why are you speaking? What do you want to say? And how are you going to say it? Um, I would very strongly encourage everybody, if there is a need for PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever, don't start your, don't start writing or designing your presentation using Google Slides or PowerPoint. That's a, that's a delivery, it's a, it's a tool, it's, a, it's the, the way you're going to deliver your message, it's not your message itself. So start with an outline, don't let, don't let the slides drive your speech or your presentation. Let your speech or presentation drive the slides. And I think you can tell by what you've seen tonight, right? I, I didn't go through and I outlined my, my points, my, my talking points or my, my notes first, then created the slides where I thought they were appropriate. The other thing it does is inevitably when somebody is using, and this is, this is where it's easy to start to go down, the, go down the rabbit hole here. When you sit down and you start to outline your presentation in the, the tool, in slides or, or PowerPoint, inevitably it becomes too long because what happens is you're, you're doing a brain dump and you're putting in all of your words and all of your thoughts and all of your ideas into this one document. Inevitably it becomes way too long, way too many words. And then people will, will get the sense that, oh, okay, well, if I forget what I'm gonna say here, I just turn and look up at the board and <clears throat> it's, my, it's my prompt. Um, and then it becomes a crutch. And then your, your presentation or your speech becomes story time where you're reading something to the audience as opposed to actually speaking to them. So, um, it, and if you think about, actually, if anyone, if you were to think about, if I were to ask you, you know, what is the, what are some of the greatest speeches you've ever heard, whether it's in person or from history or what have you, my, my guess is very few of them actually have a PowerPoint slide behind them, right? The greatest speeches in history, um, no PowerPoint. It was either pre-PowerPoint or, you know, that's, that's not how you move people. Think of PowerPoint or slides as a tool, but don't let it become a crutch. Um, in terms of content, if you don't already know, um, I, one of your homework assignments from today is going to be to pick up any book, read anything you want um, out loud, count, be, be sure that you know how many words per minute you speak. That's gonna be the key to any speech or any presentation. Because if, if you start outlining <clears throat> and you don't, <clears throat> and you're not, and, and you, I don't know of a time when you're not gonna have a time constraint. If you don't know how many words per minute you speak on average, then you're, 
inevitably you're going to have way too many. It's, it's a lot fewer than you think. So it varies. <clears throat> you have to take into account if you do think you're, you will be a little anxious at the moment, you're likely to speak a little faster within, within reason. That's not bad. You can, you can maybe jam a little bit more in there. Um, but there is, there, is a, there is an upper limit, right? So for me, uh, I'm between 120 to 150 words per minute. Um, it usually is, you know, to, if I narrow that down, it's probably more like 130 is where I usually come in. But anyway, I would, I would encourage all of you to know that for yourself. The amount of detail, again, PowerPoint or slides is a tool. And some people, often, many people, <clears throat> try to use it as, try to multi-purpose it. So it's the thing that goes on the board, it's their speaker notes, and it's also <clears throat> the same document that people, that your customer or client or whomever, investor, that you expect them to walk away with. And I'm going to say that those are really three different documents. Your speaker notes don't ever really get shared. There's no reason for them to be shared. There's the thing that goes on the wall that people will look at, which is what you're looking at tonight. And then <clears throat> if I were to deliver if I wanted to, if there was technical information or there were links you wanted to share or, you know, think, or, or just a lot of detail, you might use slides, you might use PowerPoint as the, as the tool, but the level of detail would just be totally different. So think of them as different documents, totally different documents. You can obviously base them all on each other, right? They're all related and you can work from them, but don't try to turn your PowerPoint into a technical document and don't use a technical document for speaking. Um, so then finally, the delivery piece of it, as I said, this is where, um, this is where practice comes in, right? Just you, you give the speech as many times as you need to, to get it to the level that you want it to be. You have the greatest tool in the world for practicing a speech and that's your phone. You will be shocked if you record yourself and actually look. Um, it's one of the greatest things that uh, Toastmasters does is it gives you, you can, people in the group will video record you as you speak. You will pick up all sorts of things about yourself as the way you speak. So that is, that is absolutely hands down. Even if you're doing it in your apartment, you know, and this could be your, your first, uh, uh, staff meeting, you know, your, your two minute update as to how your project is going, stick a, stick a phone in front of yourself and record yourself and see what you look like and how you come across. You'll learn a lot from that. Um, all right, let's, uh, so as I said, right, an outstanding speech or presentation is clear purpose, compelling content, and a very, very confident delivery. Easy, or, or I should say simple, but not easy. And let's go through an example of uh, this is what not to do, okay? And I guarantee you, you will see presentations like, like this in some form or another. This is dangerous for so many ways. First of all, people are gonna glaze over. They're, they're either going to read and not listen to you or they're gonna listen to you and this is just causes a headache. Um, but you will see this. And, and here's the challenge. And again, when you're pressed for time, it's easy to put a lot of words up on the board and <laughs> feel like, okay, if I get stuck, I can turn and I can look and I don't remember what it is I had to say. That's the, that, that flag should tell you you need to really spend time with your content because what happens is you're gonna, you know, you're, if you're looking at me like I'm giving a speech and the, and the whiteboard is behind me, I, I'm gonna be doing this. And <clears throat> I guarantee you, Everyone in your audience can read, and you know, turning your presentation into story time is not a way to uh, prove your capabilities or, or confidence, or people won't have confidence in you or your products. Um, <clears throat> how does this look? Is this more compelling? Now, this requires that you, know, that you understand what these prompts are, right? Now, the good news is you can use this to help guide you through your speech, 
right? They're markers that, that they'll help you remember all of your points, but they're not going to help you remember all of your content. So this is even probably a lot of words. I wouldn't use any more words than you currently see here. Um, images are helpful. It's what I've tried to do in here, right? I mean, you saw this, right? Hopefully that had an impact and, and you'll walk away from, if you remember something from this, you'll maybe remember one of these slides. So, okay, um, we shift gears here. So that was, that was everything that I had for tonight on um, speaking and, and presentation. Mike, let me ask you, do, did most, do most of your speakers allow um, question time at the end or? Yeah, if you wanna open it up for questions either now on public speaking or um, at the end, um, I think that'd be great. Maybe we'll okay. pause for a minute, see if anybody has any questions and then. <coughs> um, I, I think I'll probably just keep going. Um, and then okay. if we have, yeah, if we have some questions at the end, we'll, we'll do that. So um, what I wanted to cover here is that the idea, um, and again, you've heard me talk about it, but um, this, it really gets to the premise of the whole book and, and what I've tried to do in my own career. Um, but what, what I sort of discovered or my, for myself really, is there is um, around the word career experience, right? Every single job posting you'll ever see will say one year of experience, five years of experience, 10 years of experience required, something along those lines. And what I've seen in my own career is that, you know, 10 years of experience doesn't look the same on different people. Or to say it another way, there's a difference between what I say here, the difference between tenure, which is purely the number of years you've been in a job versus your career experience. And again, so, so, you, so I'm not asking you to, to take my word for it. I'll, I'll try to prove it out with an example. So <clears throat> if, and let's, let's, make it, let's make it directly relevant to what you guys are gonna do in the summer. So you, any one of you uh, join your firms and let's say there's a second intern. They've hired two interns. You both have similar jobs within this company. You both show up to work every day. You both do roughly the same quality work, but you, hopefully now that you've, you, you've kind of become aware of this idea, you go further. You prepare your speeches. You join a Toastmasters group. You work on your business writing. You build your professional network. You do kind of all of these things and it's not limited to the ideas that I have within the book, within my book, but, but any sort of professional development that you do above and beyond coming into the office every day and doing your work, that's what adds to your career experience. So what I'm suggesting here is that your overall career experience is sure, it's the number of years that you've been on the job. There's learning that happens there and, and that's a piece of it. But the thing that will differentiate you are the skills that you build and then the other two chapters, which I wrestle with calling them skills by my strict definition, they're not really skills, but they're important aspects of, of career development being personal brand. And I know you guys had a, um, you had a session on that. Um, and then executive presence is, is the other piece of it there. So um, just to, to, maybe illustrate with a, a related example, or maybe it's a bit of a tangent of an example, but if you guys, this is more fun to do in a room because I get to see people's uh, faces as they react to this, but only about a third of the people that I show this image to have actually seen this arrow in the FedEx logo, right? This is, you, you probably see this logo, <laughs> you probably see this logo you know, 10 times a day and you don't even realize it, right? One of the most recognized uh, iconic logos in the world today. But now that you've, now that I've showed this, now that I've highlighted this arrow to you, you can't not see it. I guarantee you, every time you see the logo, you're going to see this arrow. And the reason I use this as an example 
is because I want you to, every time you see the word career experience, I want you to think about what we talked about here tonight, right? The, the overall experience, the overall, your overall career experience is not limited to the number of years you have as an employee. It's about your own professional development. It's the skills that you build. It's the network that you develop. It's the things you do above and beyond your job, above and beyond your paycheck to improve yourself as a, you know, as a, as a employee or a founder or an investor or what have you. So <clears throat> I hope that really will stick with you and you'll smile a little bit the next time you see a FedEx truck and then it'll remind you and you'll think of this and, and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so I added real quickly, I added um, some resources here at the end. Um, this first one here uh, is actually, it's Dale Carnegie. They're, they're, all, these, all these images are linked, by the way. So um, uh, Dale Carnegie is one, uh, they have a tremendous number of very either free or low cost training opportunities. Um, clear to the point is about uh, PowerPoint presentations. This YouTube video, I think it's just hilarious. Um, he's done a couple of them, but it, you know, take five minutes for a good laugh after the class if you wanna see that. Um, around the idea of practice and you know, developing these, these professional habits and skills. And I like these books. I really like this um, Power of Habit book. I really like them all, but uh, if I were to read one from this page, it would be, it would be this one. Um, but they're all excellent. Eat That Frog is a very, is a super easy read. Um, these are probably three of my most favorite books. Um, I, I can't think who moved my cheese. I cannot, I reread it just this week, actually, uh, for the first time, probably in a couple of years. I can't think of a more appropriate book for the times that we're currently living in. Um, it's appropriate now. It'll be appropriate for your career. But basically, it's about dealing with change. Um, <clears throat> Go Giver, I'm not going to give you any insight as to what it's about, other than it is a wonderful, wonderful parable. It's and, an awesome, awesome book. Highly you know, recommend it. Okay, I read it last year. Love it. Yeah. It's, um, I've given away probably 20 or 30 copies. If, if I was there in DC, I would have brought copies for all of you. Um, I love the book. It, I've read that probably eight or 10 times already. Um, it just, and for Georgetown alumni, I think it's even more powerful because it really largely captures what your experience is now as a student and will be uh, as, as a member of the alumni community. Um, this last one, Mastery, is a little quirky, but I, I enjoy it. Um, so <clears throat> how do we look at that? Real quick, <clears throat> some Georgetown related uh, resources. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I've been involved in, well, I've been involved in all of these, um, a founder or a co-founder of all of these. Uh, the Georgetown Angel Investor Network I alluded to at the beginning of our, of our class tonight. Um, we've got about 45 investors who are investing in Georgetown and Georgetown related companies. So do your summer internships, start your companies and know that there are alumni who are there <clears throat> to help. Um, with uh, when it comes time for raising money, <clears throat> we're really committed to this community. The Entrepreneurship Alliance is the broader umbrella. Gain is part of that, but it's the broader umbrella. Um, I helped launch the GEA for the Alumni Association a few years back. Um, and then Quay Gateway, again, I, I can't think of another tool right now that that's, could be any more valuable for, for both students and alumni in terms of connecting with other alumni. For anyone who doesn't know what it is, uh, there are about 6,000 alumni who have all raised their hand and said, I'm, I want to talk to a student. I want to talk to fellow alumni. And so there's not a 100% response rate, but the response rate is close to, I think, 80%. Given current circumstances, that might dip down a little bit. But, um, but know that for the most part, the people in that system in that database are there because they want to talk with you about a big or a small thing. So I would encourage you to use that tool as well. So um, I am happy to take any questions either now or, you know, Mike, <coughs> I realized I didn't put anywhere any of my contact information. I'm happy to have to share it with the group um, email. And um, so best contact information for me is just, it's first name Jeff, J-E-F-F, -F, 
at, and then it's career-ology. It's probably in the book, but it's just the word career dash o l o g y dot com. There we go. <coughs> so, um, I, and I realize I, I jumped ahead in my in my um, uh, introduction as well. I mentioned I've been involved with the alumni association for a long time. I was the alumni association president from 2016 to 18. Um, another organization around the university I'd encourage you to, um, to look at. You don't have to wait to be an alumnus to see what it's all about and, and uh, you know, and, and maybe be involved in some extent. So I'm happy to talk with people after now or afterwards uh, via email or chat or anything about anything we talked about tonight, any one of these organizations or any other thing about Georgetown that I can be helpful for you.